Welcome to the Tim Booker channel, where wisdom is worth spreading. We wish you a pleasant listening experience. In the year 2008, the subprime mortgage crisis swept through Wall Street, leaving devastation in its wake, with repercussions felt around the world. However, amidst this financial tsunami, there was a group of individuals who not only emerged and scathed but also filled their pockets to the brim. This is what today's book is all about, The Big Short. It can be said that this is a professional book that even those outside the industry can find engrossing. Why do we say this? Well, you see, there are many books that delve into the subprime mortgage crisis, such as the famous, Too Big to Fail, and The Great Recession, which are well-researched with in-depth interviews and recollections, offering a vivid portrayal of the crisis and profound reflections on the market. They adopt a macro perspective, which is beneficial for decision-making and regulation. However, it may be challenging for many outside the financial sector to relate to these books. But, the big short is different. It takes a micro perspective and tells the story of ordinary market participants. These individuals are not industry titans or financial giants, they are regular people. Yet, they accurately predicted market trends before the crisis erupted and reaped massive profits. It can be said that this is an extraordinary story that happened to ordinary people. However, if it were just an engaging story, this book would not be considered a classic. The Big Short offers both excitement and insights. It provides a realistic portrayal of the intricacies of financial trading, the thought processes of individuals, and their behavior. Consequently, this book has received high praise even within the financial industry and has at times flooded the social circles of finance professionals. This is largely because the author of the book, Michael Lewis, is himself a seasoned financial expert. He worked in top-tier investment banks on Wall Street for many years, and his understanding of the financial industry is exceptionally insightful. Earlier in his career, he also published a book called Liar's Poker, which is a classic that provides insight into the Wall Street culture of the 1980s. Now, with his latest work, The Big Short, he once again demonstrates his professional prowess. However, before delving into the captivating story of The Big Short, let's clarify a key concept that runs through the entire book, the term short selling. When we talk about finance, you've probably heard of the term financial products. There are numerous financial products, ranging from simple ones like stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, to more complex ones like structured asset-backed securities and various types of derivatives. It might all seem quite complex, but at its core, a financial product is just a contract. Where there's a contract, there are two parties, party A and party B, sometimes with a broker or intermediary involved. In essence, the financial industry revolves around risk and expectations. The fact that contracts are signed typically indicates that both parties have different views on the risks and expectations regarding a particular event. Those who believe the event will rise in value are said to have a long position, while those who expect it to fall are said to have a short position. So, in any given trade, you'll have both long and short sides. In a market, there are always two waves of opinions, emotions, and people, the bulls and the bears. The financial market continually generates contracts, and if the future goes as anticipated, the party with the corresponding view profits. If the market falls, the short side makes money. In this episode, we're going to discuss contracts related to mortgage loans. In the 2008 financial crisis, the housing bubble in the United States burst, leading to a catastrophic downfall in both the American real estate and financial markets, a disaster for the longs. However, before this disaster struck, there was a group of contrarians who not only remained sober but also reaped enormous profits. They are the protagonists of this book. Though they were only four in number, they collectively made over $2 billion during this storm, making them absolute winners. Next, we'll delve into the stories of these four individuals, which form the core of this book. Then, we'll delve deeper and analyze the logic behind their triumphant success in the face of adversity, let me introduce these four individuals to you. If you can't remember their names, remember their characteristics, for it's their traits that truly define the big short. First, we have the isolated Barry. Barry, originally a medical doctor, became infatuated with stocks and bonds from a young age. While most doctors might use their downtime to read or sleep, Barry spent his free time researching stocks. He started a blog online to share stock analyses and recommended stocks in chat groups. His stock analyses were consistently accurate, 
and those who followed his advice usually made money, a track record of success. With growing popularity, he decided to quit his medical career and establish his own fund, attracting clients and becoming a professional fund manager. However, unlike most fund managers who engage in investor relations and promotional activities, Barry was reclusive. He didn't like interacting with investors. His philosophy was simple, if you trust me, invest with me, if not, move on. Barry had a habit of solitude, and all investment decisions were made in his own space, relying on calculations and analysis of numbers. Through rigorous mathematical analysis, Barry discovered that although mortgage-related financial products in the United States seemed safe in 2005, by mid-2007, they were likely to face significant problems. Real estate and related financial product prices were expected to plummet, making it an opportune time for short selling. Barry began looking for loans to sign a type of contract called a credit default swap, CDS. This contract allowed both parties to bet on whether mortgage defaults would occur. How did the bet work? As the short side, Barry, he would pay the long side a fee ranging from two-tenths of a percent to two percent of the total amount of mortgage bonds being shorted each year. If mortgage defaults did occur, the long side would compensate Barry for the total amount of these bonds. This contract is somewhat like insurance but with a difference. Insurance involves paying premiums annually, and if your home is burglarized, the insurance company pays you the amount insured. CDS, on the other hand, is like Barry, a person unrelated to you, buying insurance on your property, betting that your home will certainly be burglarized. If your home isn't burglarized, Barry pays regular premiums, but if it happens as he wishes, he makes a substantial profit. So, in essence, this was a wager between Barry and the Longs on whether those who took out loans to buy homes would default. As we all know, if home prices drop significantly compared to the time when the loans were taken out, it no longer makes financial sense to continue making payments, leading to many defaults. Thus, Barry and the Longs were betting on whether home prices would fall. The Longs believed they wouldn't and were attracted to the annual premiums Barry would pay, while Barry was confident that the Longs would eventually owe him a substantial amount. He was so confident in his judgment that he invested all his funds, even dealing with top financial institutions, as he believed smaller ones wouldn't have the financial capacity to pay up when the time came, during Barry's search for Longs, the second player entered the scene, the astute Lawrence Lippmann. Lippmann was an over-the-counter trader, a middleman, or what we call a broker, making commissions by facilitating trades. When he heard about Barry's quest for Longs to sign contracts, he sensed an opportunity and carefully analyzed the logic and data behind mortgage products. He realized that not only was there a potential issue, but it could also be a major catastrophe. However, Lippmann lacked the capital to short the market. So what did he do? No problem. He decided to stick to his core role, brokering deals and earning commissions. At that time, no one believed there would be a problem, as Longs were everywhere. All he needed to do was find a short seller, and they could agree on commissions and fees. He began sharing his research findings, finally finding someone willing to short the market, which leads us to the third player, the genius and eccentric Steve Eisman. Eisman was not only a Harvard-educated high achiever, he had an insatiable curiosity. Growing up in a Jewish family, he immersed himself in Jewish classics. However, his approach was different from most, he didn't study earnestly out of belief or devotion but rather with the intent to uncover logical inconsistencies, to find the bugs. Eisman had an extremely low tolerance for logical flaws, and he would never touch investments that didn't make sense logically. When the astute Lippmann told him about shorting real estate-related financial products, Eisman was skeptical and had to verify it himself. He and his team traveled across the United States, meeting with renters, homebuyers, real estate agents, and financial institutions issuing mortgages. They also visited institutions holding real estate-related financial products and third-party agencies responsible for rating these mortgages. Through this extensive research, they discovered that the real estate market was fundamentally flawed. Even individuals with unstable incomes were able to secure loans for multiple houses. Some even took out loans in their pets' names. It was absurd. Eisman concluded that those who believed in the housing market and went all in were either crazy or foolish. So, Eisman decided to pool all his resources and go all in on shorting the market. While the astute Lippmann spread the word and searched for short sellers, two young newcomers heard the keyword, shorting real estate, and were immediately interested. 
Unlike most people who might dismiss such talk, these two were specialists in short selling. With limited capital, they focused on shorting products with high odds of success. This meant betting against assets that were overvalued and underestimated in terms of risk. Using this strategy, they turned $110,000 into $30 million in just three years. When they calculated the odds of shorting the real estate market this time, it seemed too tempting to pass up. The two found a seasoned veteran to guide them and joined forces to develop a detailed shorting strategy. They went all in, each putting their entire fortune into this high-stakes gamble. So, each of these players put their chips on the table, and now they awaited the fall in real estate prices and the subsequent mortgage defaults, this process was incredibly challenging. In a market dominated by long positions, going all in on short positions was an excruciating ordeal. For example, Barry's funds were raised from investors, and they began to complain as the market turmoil escalated. Barry, who was already reclusive, chose to cut off all communication with his clients, retreating further into his own world. Genius Steve Eisman faced doubts after repeated bombardment from others, making him wonder if he had lost his mind. Astute Lawrence Lipman, being a trader, had it a bit easier since he didn't invest his own capital. However, he faced mockery from colleagues for putting his income at risk by sharing short positions with short sellers. Only the three unexpected players, two young and fearless and one season pro, remained relatively calm throughout the ordeal. As we all know, the storm eventually hit with a level of devastation that far exceeded everyone's estimates. Real estate prices and financial product values collapsed dramatically, stock prices plummeted, and a frantic rush to sell ensued. The entire market was selling off, leading to a liquidity crisis. Long positions were decimated, suffering massive losses. For instance, the once prominent trader Howie Hubler, who held $16 billion in long contracts before the financial crisis, ultimately incurred net losses of $9 billion, making it the largest single trading loss in Wall Street history. In contrast, the minority short sellers reaped substantial profits. According to market estimates, the four players we discussed earlier collectively profited over $2 billion. The world of financial investing is a roller coaster, and both long and short positions experienced the ups and downs. Whether you're inside or outside the financial industry, revisiting this story is bound to evoke deep emotions. However, it's essential to remember that this story isn't as simple as the narrative of lone heroes among the short sellers and foolishness among the longs. The big short sellers weren't heroes, and the long positions weren't necessarily foolish. They were all ordinary market participants chasing profits. The fundamental difference lay in their thinking and expectations, which led to different choices and outcomes. In the end, there's only one direction in the market, right or wrong. Capital markets are ruthless, and the ultimate outcome is a result of individual judgments. In this case, the long positions just happen to be wrong. So, why did they get it wrong, and what did they do differently? Some criticize the financial institutions for extending mortgages to clients with poor repayment capacity. But those who make such claims are often unaware of the intricacies. Lending is a game of profitability and beating default rates. As long as property prices kept rising and the mortgaged assets were appreciating, loans appeared safe. Loosening lending criteria seemed reasonable. Others blamed investment banks for packaging and restructuring housing loans into structured financial products, inflating the bubble. However, structured finance was merely an innovative financial product, a tool. Tools themselves are neither right nor wrong. Investment banks invented a new contract, created a new market, facilitated liquidity, and added value. Some might argue that rating agencies were at fault, always giving high ratings to assets that didn't deserve them, first using clever tricks to mask the issues and then resorting to outright misrepresentation. However, they too had their constraints. The major rating agencies comprised a top three. If you refused to give a particular rating, the client could simply turn to another agency for a more favorable one. When students fail, teachers don't get paid. Would a teacher willingly give you a failing grade when everyone else is passing? Everyone needs to make a living. The long positions, it seemed, were doing what they believed was perfectly reasonable. Why did they continue to act this way? Two main factors played a role. Firstly, the wealth effect was evident. As property prices continually rose, those in long positions made money, and it was hard not to feel envious. Moreover, 
if you didn't participate, others were more than willing to take your place. Underperforming was a minor concern, you could easily be replaced. Secondly, human instinct came into play, including herd mentality. When everyone else is doing the same thing, you start to doubt your own judgment if you go against the crowd, people like Barry, who is reclusive, and individuals like Iceman, who are stubborn, are the ones who are abnormal. I'm certainly not crazy. So, you see, every long position believes they are in the right because, in the interconnected and complex financial market system, their actions constantly reinforce one another. Slowly, they increase the overall leverage of the entire financial system to an unimaginable level, making it hypersensitive to changes in real estate prices. This means that even a small increase in property prices would bring about hundreds of times the profits. But it also means that if property prices were to fall, the consequences would be dire. Long positions enjoyed the amplified profits during the period of strong property prices, happily calculating their gains every day. Yet, they never considered the potential costs when property prices might decline. Their blind optimism, believing that property prices would never fall, was their error, and a grave one at that. Because they never thought property prices could fall, they never continuously re-evaluated the market or their own actions to see if they remained appropriate. A simple principle, someone without preconceptions can understand even the most challenging issues, even if they are not particularly clever. However, if someone believes with absolute certainty that they already understand the problem in front of them, even the simplest of matters will elude them. These words were spoken by the great writer Tolstoy and are inscribed on the flyleaf of The Big Short. The long positions were wrong because of their unwavering self-assuredness, their cognitive blind spots preventing them from carefully assessing the changing market conditions. In the end, this led to their downfall. It's not the ones who can't swim that drown but those who falsely believe they can. On the other hand, the short sellers weren't heroes either. They simply recognized that property prices were reaching their limits when analyzing the market and that when that day came, the market would become a disaster for the long positions. In the midst of the fervor for going long, being able to identify this was quite remarkable. To become a big short seller, you need to be successful at identifying short opportunities. So, how did they discover these opportunities? From a professional perspective, it's not about guessing, it's about having a well-developed investment and decision-making methodology. In this regard, the various big short sellers each had their strengths. For example, the reclusive Barry based his investment logic on going long on undervalued assets while shorting overhyped ones in the market. He locked himself away and used his proven analytical and calculation methods to continuously identify potential stocks. With this approach, he founded a fund and identified a severe overvaluation of real estate prices, deciding to go all in on short positions. Genius Steve Eisman's investment logic was similar to Barry's, going long on undervalued assets and shorting those that were overhyped. However, Eisman wasn't a recluse, his approach involved thoroughly understanding a project's logic, conducting on-site research, and only shorting what he could see clearly. When he discovered glaring flaws in the logic supporting rising property prices and a growing clarity in the shorting logic, he chose to become a short seller. In reality, these two shared a well-known investment logic known as value investing. The rise of this investment approach occurred in recent decades. After the Great Depression in the 1930s, the financial industry underwent profound reflection. Markets became more regulated, moving away from the days when success was determined by the quantity of ammunition available to long and short positions. Instead, investment success increasingly relied on scientific decision-making. This marked the birth of value investing. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, had many disciples and followers. One of the most famous was his protege, someone you might have heard of, Warren Buffett. Now, regarding the investment logic of the two inexperienced young men who joined forces with the seasoned pro, it was more like guerrilla warfare. They weren't value investors, they mainly capitalized on the tendency for people to underestimate risks and the favorable odds in short selling. They had been playing a small but highly profitable game for several years, focusing on shorting products with high risk-adjusted returns. So, it made sense for them to transition into a larger short position strategy, with the guidance of their experienced colleague. To become the big short, you need to recognize shorting opportunities successfully, the short sellers each used their unique methods to discover the opportunity for shorting, but thinking that finding the opportunity guarantees success would be overly naive. 
It's merely the first step in successful investing. The key to the massive returns earned by the big short sellers lay in their unwavering commitment to their investment strategies. Many people, despite realizing that something was amiss, either barely survived the storm or left empty-handed because they failed to fully adhere to their investment strategies. One reason long positions lost was due to being swept up in the market's atmosphere. Almost all financial institutions and market participants were obsessed with the continuous rise in real estate prices. Only the big short sellers obstinately clung to their convictions. They were like wolves that had caught a scent and waited resolutely. They wouldn't give up until they had their prey. Imagine if Barry weren't the reclusive Barry, if he didn't avoid interacting with investors. Could he withstand the relentless bombardment from investors? Could he lock himself in a small room and wait for his predictions to come true? If Eisman weren't a genius with an obsession for logical rigor, would he have held his short positions despite repeated doubts from others? If the two inexperienced young men hadn't distanced themselves from Wall Street and faced continuous pressure, and if they didn't have a seasoned mentor to guide them, would they have had the courage to see it through to the end? Success always seems easy in hindsight, but in reality, the big short sellers went through a very agonizing and conflicted period while waiting for the market to validate their judgments. After all, staying put when everyone else doubts your sanity is a profoundly counterintuitive action. When everyone in the market is calling you a fool or a madman, maintaining your judgment day after day amidst criticism and pressure demands tremendous inner strength and steadfastness. Of course, it's precisely because most people were swept away by the market that the big short sellers ultimately achieved exceptionally high returns. One could say that this is the market's reward for the bald eagle that fiercely guarded its prey. In conclusion, the big short sellers won by spotting opportunities in the market and by sticking to their independent judgments. The financial market is a ruthless and pragmatic arena where any cognitive blind spot can lead to a comprehensive defeat. Human weaknesses are often the roadblocks on the path to success. If there's one thing to remember from this storm, it's the importance of maintaining humility, continuous self-reflection, overcoming cognitive blind spots, and addressing human weaknesses to achieve enduring success, all right, that concludes the story of, The Big Short. Let's recap. First, we introduced the origins of, The Big Short and talked about the reclusive Barry, the shrewd Lippmann, the genius and obsessive Iceman, and the three guerrilla winners. These four short sellers discovered opportunities in the market and entered the game. They resisted various pressures and, ultimately, in the panic of the financial storm, reaped substantial rewards because they accurately predicted the market's steep decline. Due to cognitive blind spots and the belief in the myth of rising house prices, numerous financial institutions blindly held long positions, only to end up in a disastrous situation. The big short sellers, on the other hand, correctly assessed the market's direction and held on to their short positions, resulting in significant profits. These financially savvy individuals, adorned with high intelligence, experienced varying fates after the subprime crisis. Some became unemployed, others even went bankrupt, some amassed debt, while a few emerged and scathed and profited immensely. It's a stark contrast in outcomes, as there are only two choices, success or failure. The financial market is indeed such a place, either a path to prosperity or a route to ruin. Some even liken it to a California hotel, as sung in a song, it can be heaven or it can be hell. Although one enters by choice, leaving is seemingly impossible. We often wonder what drives these players to keep betting on the financial table, what entangles them in waves of prosperity and crisis, yet they remain hooked and unrelenting. This tremendous force is the ceaseless pursuit of profit. In the financial market, greed can be seen as a duty, and profit as the only criterion. Here, the world is bustling, all for the sake of profit, and the world is clamoring, all for the pursuit of gain. It's precisely the relentless pursuit of profit driven by capital and human greed that has kept the financial market lively for over three centuries, with one wave after another of ups and downs, crises, and storms. You finish your part, and I take the stage. While there may be highs and lows, ebbs and flows, it never stays quiet, in fact, it becomes increasingly lively. The stories of hustle and bustle are still unfolding, and the stories of money will continue. Alright, that's all for this edition. Congratulations, you've just finished another book. Thank you for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker Channel audiobook channel. Like and share it with your family and friends. Wisdom is worth spreading, paving the way for a better future. Thank you, 
and goodbye.